Because I'm not giving much hope for the adults anymore, but I'm going to ask children to write letters to the government. I'm going to ask non-Aboriginal children to write letters to the government because maybe they'll listen to the non-Aboriginal children. And so she created this YouTube video about all of the conditions that they were going to school in and she asked non-Aboriginal children to join her. She never even met these kids. She just put it on YouTube and she prayed. And one of those little girls that got, uh, saw the YouTube video was from here in Toronto. And she gets out her pen and paper. She says, Dear Prime Minister Harper, here's all the things I did in school today, and we have heat, by the way. Um, and so why aren't First Nations kids getting that? And she sends it off in the mail. She wonders if the Prime Minister is going to write back. He's a busy man. But he does. And she opens up the letter that she gets. And it's a larger envelope than just a letter. So she opens it up, and the first thing she pulls out of there is a four by six autograph photo of Stephen Harper. <laughs> Along with the letter saying how nice it is to hear from a young person. But it didn't answer her question. And so she took it to show and tell at her school and told the other kids all about it. And they decided there was only one thing to do. And this is a great thing about kids. They don't strike committees or wring their hands about what they're going to do. <laughs> You know, they actually get down to doing something. And so they decided what they'd do is they'd all stand against the blackboard. They'd have the teacher take their picture, they would sign it, and they would send it back to the Prime Minister. <laughs> now kids by the thousands started joining Shannon's dream. And they uh, began sending letters and they decided that even better than sending letters, we can read them out in person in Parliament. So. Just on this day, on April 27, 2011, a bunch of kids, school buses pull up in front of Parliament and the kids pile out and they have all these signs about equal education for First Nations. And they have a red radio flyer wagon with that school on the top. You see the school there that made out of paper mache? That's their mailbox for all the letters that they were about to read. And when I asked the girls, I said, well, why did you make this school? They said, well, we wanted, we're nine years old. We wanted to show the government that it's not that hard to build a school. <laughs> so people weren't convinced. People don't think the kids really understand a lot of these things. And the, this one little guy um, who has some different special needs, he's a very special boy, very special boy. But he was one of those children who felt that no one ever listened to him. Why would anyone want to listen to a child like me? So he wrote his letter, but he kept on throwing it into the trash bin. And every time he'd throw it into the trash bin, the teacher would come and get it and put it back and say that, you know what, uh, I'd really like you to read this letter. He'd throw it back into the trash bin again. You all have all those kids, don't you? Well, on the fourth try, he finally decided he would do something courageous, and he is one of the first kids to read his letter of Parliament Hill. We talk about heroes. Harry's one of mine. He gets up there and he says, Dear Prime Minister Harper, do you have a cat? <laughs> he says, I have a cat. His name is Micah and he's a boy and he is black. Harry's a rock collector. Likes to polish up the stones so everything in his life that's sacred to him, he names after a type of a rock. And he gets right down to business. He says, Stephen Harper, listen to me. If you do not build more schools, you're going to create a crime wave and lose all of your money. <laughs> because kids who cannot go to school and will not be able to get jobs when they're bigger. But they're still going to need money, so some of them are going to have to steal it. And then people in the community are going to get mad because crooks are invading their homes. So you better man up right now and build more schools. Love, Harry. <laughs> so Shannon herself was her whole thing was filling up with, with mail but she was 13 years old and she dreamed of being a human rights lawyer there was a high school in her community but it's so underfunded uh, there's no way that she'd ever become the human rights lawyer that she did she wanted to be and so she moves hundreds of miles away to New Liskert and for the first time in her life she's standing in the school uh, hallway of a proper school 
And she finds her way into a classroom and she sees all the things that other children have to learn. And tears start falling down her face. And when she's asked why, she says, I wish I could live my life over again so I could go to a school as nice as this. It was only a few months later, late night on a highway on her way back to school, the school she would have never gone to had it been properly funded in her own home, that she tragically dies on the highway, in a car accident. The children she inspired were, of course, devastated at the loss of their great hero. So, but they created a Facebook page that night called Shannon's Dream, and they pledged that they will continue to write letters to the government until every First Nations child in this country gets a safe and comfy school, as Shannon wanted, and an education that prepares them for their dreams. And those children have returned to Parliament twice a year with a thousand or more letters, and they are writing them from daycare on up. There is a bunch of four-year-olds. People say kids are, need to be a certain age before they can understand this. There is a bunch of four-year-olds who had decorated hearts about what every child needs to be happy. And their wonderful early childhood educator had them come up and then pin them to a clothesline. And then the bigger kids who were could taking the letters to the mailbox, they would all either say something about why they picked that heart. It might be a clean glass of water, or a tree, or uh, a, a good food to eat. Then the kids went around their daycare four times, one for the, each of the four directions in First Nations culture. And then they put their little hearts into the mailbox for the big kids to deliver. Because children, all children, want to make the world a better place. And they can, they just need the opportunity to express that. And you can go on, we have all kinds of educator resources for Shannon's Dream. So not only can you sign up as individuals, will you sign up as individuals? Yeah? You can also go on there and bring it into your classrooms. So that you can bring Shannon's Dream and social justice and really help this generation of children turn this page of discrimination towards one of hope and justice. Now what about this case? So I'm a social worker. I'm not a lawyer. Um, and I never ever thought in a million years that I would end up in this, in a courtroom for nine years with the federal government. Fighting to try and get them to provide equal services for First Nations children. Little kids. I think like a lot of you, I was naive. I don't mean that in a disrespectful way to you or to I, but I believe, like Dr. Bryce believed, if you documented the inequality, which we did as early as 2000, we documented the harms to children, the growing numbers of children in care. There are more First Nations children in care today than at the Haida Residential School. Driven there by the same reasons, poverty, poor housing, substance misuse related to intergenerational trauma. And then we created a funding formula to fix it. They would do the right thing, don't you think so? We did it twice and nothing changed. When we created the Caring Society, and people often think we're a big organization, but we're actually only one full-time staff and three part-time staff. Uh, but we had a great teaching by an elder, and he said, never fall in love with the Caring Society. And never fall in love with your business card. Only fall in love with the children. Because there may come a time when you have to sacrifice both those things for them. So after we'd worked with the government for 10 years and they didn't implement any of those actions, we felt we had no choice. We partnered with the Assembly of First Nations and we filed a human rights case against the government. Saying they're racially discriminating against 163,000 children. It was the biggest human rights case of our time. And yet I can still hear the sound of my footsteps on Parliament stairs as I walked out of that room because nobody was there. Nobody was there. Where was everybody? What else was more important than racial discrimination against 163,000 little kids? But I believed it was because most caring Canadians didn't know about these enemies. So we created this campaign called I Am a Witness. All, we load up all of Government of Canada's court documents, all of ours, and we simply ask you to watch. We don't want you to take a side. 
We believe in your goodness. You can see the evidence. You decide what's going on. So we file this case. Within 30 days, we lose all of our federal government funding. But this is something I'd like to say to all of you. Is that there comes a time when you've got to stand up for kids, isn't it? And uh, we filed that case. We had $50,000 in the bank. We knew we were going up against the biggest law firm in the country, the Department of Justice. And we expected they, they would fight it vigorously, and they did. But I, it took me back. So any reasonable person is what I'm saying. Any reasonable person would have never done this. But it was really due to my aunt. When I was nine years old, how many people remember the good old Eaton's catalog? All right, this, that makes me feel better. <laughs> so every Christmas, I'd circle the Easy Bake Oven. And over the years, I would increase the number of circles, hoping somebody this year will listen. I sent it off to my aunt. And then her Christmas parcel arrived, and there was something that looked a lot like a book. Not an easy make. So anyway, I was taught by my mom, be grateful, and I whip it open, and it's this thing of poetry. I wasn't too impressed with it then. But it included a poem that came back to me that day when we filed the complaint. It's about faith. Not religious faith. Although for some of you that might be the same thing, something else. It has a definition of faith, it's a poem, and it says when you reach that place where light turns into darkness, there will be something solid to stand on or you will be taught to fly. So we stepped across that place where light led into darkness, and the something solid to stand on or you were taught to fly came in the mail. It was a letter with pencil crayon on it. The very best letters I receive have crayon and pencil crayon on the outside. <laughs> they are the ones I open first. And as I walked to my office, it shook. And when I opened it up, it said, Dear Cindy, here's some M-U-N-Y for the kids. Love, Ella. And inside was $1.67 from her piggy bank. Children have been the largest donors to the Caring Society in terms of numbers. We never ask children for money. But children see when something's wrong, and they want to do something right. And I knew with that $1.67 that somehow we'd be able to hang in there. So for the next six years, the federal government spent at least $8 million trying to get the case derailed on legal technicalities. But on uh, February 24th of 2013, it went to trial. It is the first time in the world that a government has been on trial for its treatment of a generation of children before a body that can make a, uh, a binding order. And um, do you want to see some of the evidence? Yeah. Um, so before I get there, though, I want to say these are the ones that showed up at the hearings first, the witnesses. Um, the, the first few years in a courtroom, there was really nobody there. But then a group of teenagers showed up. Uh, one young man said to me, we're from alternative school, which means we get into trouble a lot. <laughs> I said, that's okay, because so do I. <laughs> and he says, sometimes we deserve it, but sometimes it's the systems that need to be in trouble, because they're the ones that are causing the harm. But you, you're doing that, and you want our help, so that's why we're here. So they went, and they went, came back the next set of hearings with their friends in t-shirts. And when those friends in t-shirts met up with the Shannon's Dream show up, we had so many young children coming to the hearings that we would have to book them in in shifts. Can you imagine being Canada's counsel and turning around and seeing those kids? How would that make you feel arguing that case? And what would impression does that, what statement does that make to all of us? When it's really, this is the average age group that showed up to watch the trial. And what did they understand? One of the little boys uh, that was out there, he, uh, we had a party recently to celebrate the victory, and he said, you know, Cindy, what I've learned about this experience from this whole trial is that the most obvious injustices are the hardest ones to fix. But that you have to keep at it because one day it will be fixed. And so these are their children in federal court. And uh, what, this is uh, during one of the technical parts, right, where Canada was trying to get it dismissed. 
So I come home during a break, and I'm wondering, like you, what are your young children going to get out of this case? And there's a little boy, and he's got a, a piece of paper with a line down the middle. And you know the score, one, two, three, four, five? Long list on one side and a short list on the other. He says, Cindy, do you know what this is? I said, no. He said, well, the long list is when the judge asks the Canada people a question. And the short list is when the Canada people answer the judge's question. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the evidence, some of the evidence the kids saw. This was actually in the Affairs website in 2007 when we filed the case. And you can see there, this is their own website showing that they are, uh, they admit that their funding approach is significantly flawed and that it's not allowing First Nations agencies to deliver a full range of services for children. And at the bottom, you can see there, it's contributing to the growth rate of children in care, right? So this is the government itself saying that, and yet it's not taking the action needed to help kids. This is a more recent document. This is one from 2012. I could have showed you uh, dozens of these, where it shows how much they think the shortfall is, right? Um, and the, so they have all this information in the background, and this is a significant amount of money, but the real problem is that it's driving First Nations children into care. One of the, one of the um, documents that took my breath away, uh, there were a couple of them, but um, it described that the funding situation was woefully inadequate, was one document. Another one said it was creating circumstances that were dire where children were far more likely to die. So it's not as if they didn't know inside the government that this was a problem. And the spreadsheet counted up the number of nights that First Nations children were spending in foster care on reserve between 1989 and 2012. And some of you already know that First Nations children are 12 times more likely to end up in foster care than other kids. But really, that's not a very helpful way to think about it. It's not the way kids think about this. They think about how many nights till I see my mom. And that's what this spreadsheet was about. And if you added up the number of nights First Nations children in the, on reserve and in the Yukon spent in foster care between those years, 1989 and 2012, it was 66 million nights, or 187,000 years a child. That's the cost of doing nothing. And they also knew that there were inequities in services, where First Nations children would be denied services available to all others. This is one developed by Health Canada and Indian Affairs, where they're showing that a child off-reserve, they're comparing a child on and off-reserve in this jurisdiction. And the child means a, is a child with a disability and they require a wheelchair, a lift, and a stroller. If that child is a non-Aboriginal child off-reserve in, in a low-income family, they get all those things when medical professionals say they need it. But if you're that child on reserve, you get one of those devices every five years. And the lift has to be self-installed. Now, I'm not a doctor or any kind of healthcare professional, but even someone like me could figure out that kids grow. And what sense does it make, first of all, only giving them one piece of equipment that they require? And second, why would it wait 15 years? And I remember being puzzled by this when I was a line worker in the Squamish Nation. There was a little boy who needed a standing frame that was held together with duct tape. And the federal government told me that he'd have to wait another three years because it wasn't his time yet for a new piece of equipment. And I'm thinking, really, where am I living, right? Like, really? Like, I'm a taxpayer. I don't think there would be any revolution in the country if the federal government spent the money replacing a standing frame with duct tape with something that was safe for kids, right? I don't think there's any scandal with that. Um, there's something called Jordan's Principle, which was passed in the House of Commons that said that First Nations children should not be denied or delayed receipt of services because of bickering within Health Canada and Indian Affairs or with other levels of government. Um, and this is Minister Valcour. There was a report that came out authored by UNICEF that showed that uh, these disputes are happening all the time. Children are being denied orthodontic services, occupational health and therapy, speech therapy, um, prenatal care, you name it, right? Um, this is the day after that report came out in 2015. And they're still denying these things exist, even though that report came out, right? 
It's so crazy, and all we wanted is that these kid, little kids to be able to access services on the same terms. So this child welfare case, uh, the tribunal, deals with Jordan's principle, too. Now, you're the federal government. You're arguing this case. You have fought it tooth and nail for nine years, and you're at the closing arguments. Things have not gone your way. Your own documents are going against you. And even worse, your own expert witness agreed with the other side. They hired KPMG to try and refute our calculations of the shortfall, and KPMG came within 0.025% of our calculations. So we actually filed the KPMG report as evidence on our side of the case. <laughs> so thanks to the federal government for their paying for that report. Uh, but they had no expert witnesses. Nobody would testify. So they're at the written uh, arguments, and you can read the full document. I really recommend you do, right? It's on fnwitness.ca. And this is the, the nugget of what they're saying. They're saying, the complainants are relying on our own documents, really, to show that this discrimination exists. But really, these documents shouldn't be taken to be true, necessarily. <laughs> and even if they are, they could, they're not our documents, like not ours is in Canada's documents. They are the personal views of employees at given periods of time. I think the thing that was most shocking, other than having had to bring this case to get the government to treat children fairly, was the idea that over the nine years they never once advanced one argument that what they were doing was in the best interest of children. I've always said I would not have minded having a good debate with the federal government if they were saying they had something better for the kids. But it was all based on legal technicalities and what's good for the government. So we filed this thing. <laughs> And uh, this is uh, the panel of the tribunal. And uh, they released their ruling on the 26th of uh, January. Now, I received that document two days before. And um, the first, I, I was under embargo, so I couldn't talk about it. Um, but I broke the embargo, I'll tell you publicly. Uh, because I had to go and get my snow boots and another bouquet of brightly colored daisies. And I went down um, to see Dr. Bryce, and I read him the decision, and I read it to Edward B. too. And I told them, justice, Dr. Bryce and Edward, finally, justice. So overall, the panel found uh, the Government of Canada's position unreasonable unconvincing and not supported by the preponderance of evidence. Uh, I think there are many people in the First Nations community and certainly the children themselves who could have told them that a long time ago. <laughs> uh, but the tribunal panel did order the federal government to immediately stop the discrimination and to immediately properly implement Jordan's principle. Um, unfortunately, the federal government has not taken any concrete steps to implement that decision. Uh, nor have they advised us as parties that they are ruling out an appeal. So it's really critical that you are engaged in this issue and that you stand up and that you write to the Prime Minister and tell him to act on those immediate first steps. Because we have gone through the previous reports we have done that they agreed with and said, here's some things you can do right now that will eliminate some of the most egregious harms for kids. We'll fix the whole problem, but let's make a few of these lies easier. And then we can work on the other issues. And there's a little girl I want you to mention. Because when this decision came down, the federal government uh, reached out to me, and I've been happy to talk to the federal government. Uh, I told them about Kennedy. She's a little girl in Alberta. She has a tumor in her eye that had to be removed. And thankfully, a very skilled surgeon was able to do it and save her eyesight. But she required a specialized ointment to help the eye heal. Um, mom gets her daughter out of the do out of hospital. She takes her home and makes sure she's comfortable, and then goes back to the pharmacy to get the prescription filled. The pharmacist said the First Nations Inuit Health Branch has refused to fill the prescription, and um, the pharmacist says, "What is it for?" And she told him. And it's not a word I can pronounce, but it's a particular tumor that's so rare they actually had to send it down to the Centers of Disease Control in Atlanta to get it analyzed. Um, 
And so the pharmacist is outraged. He gets back on the phone. And he says, do you understand that this is what it's for? You must approve this for this little girl. And they absolutely refused. They said, absolutely not. We're not going to do it. They said, she can use Visine instead. <laughs> the same little girl requires orthodontic care. Two pediatric orthodontists have evaluated her and both concur that without immediate orthodontic care, she will have very uh, significant difficulty eating, talking, and she is going to be in chronic pain. If they don't do it soon, of course, because she's a growing girl, it'll get to a point where surgery is the only option. The current cost is $8,000 for the orthodontic care. If they wait until it's too late, and let's face it, she would be suffering it'll be $20,000 to the taxpayer. She still doesn't have what she needs. Now, I don't know of any taxpayer, of any political backing, that is going to get upset if Kennedy gets her eye drops and gets her orthodontics. Are you with me with that? Can you let the Prime Minister know that too? Because Words are not enough when it comes to kids. You gotta do something. You gotta listen and you gotta do something to change their lives, right? And they look to us, they count on us as adults to stand up for them. And so the little kids that I work with, this is them just last week on Have a Hard Day. They were back writing letters, they were honoring Shanna's dream. And one of them uh, got up to the podium and this child now has been uh, involved in this for half of his life, he says. <laughs> I've been doing this half my life. <laughs> How many more letters am I going to have to send? He says, it's time for these people to get off of the couch and actually do something, right? And I think that's right. But these same kids have kept their promise and they keep coming back year after year because they understand that change isn't in words, it's when you actually do something that matters. It's the same thing with kids, right? If you tell them you love them but you never show they love you love them, they never believe it, right? You gotta tell them you love them and then you gotta show them that you love them, right? So this is a great group called Project of Heart. Uh, they are teachers and they bring residential school education into your classrooms, it's free of charge. Those children involved in Project of Hearts are the same ones in Shannon's dream. They understand the residential school experience from a place of what can we learn about it and how can we make our society better. They won the Governor General's Award for Teaching. It is a fantastic organization and it's free of charge for all of you. And uh, that's something we did with Project of Heart and the kids last year is we planted a heart garden in memory of each of the children that was died in residential schools that Dr. Bryce tried to save. And the children and the residential school survivors planted this heart garden in Rideau Hall right after, as a close of the TRC ceremony. But the kids, uh, you know, remember I said at the very beginning, reconciliation is about listening and then doing something with what you know, right? Had we done that with Dr. Bryce, we would have had a lot of children's lives been saved. Had we done it with Edward B, a lot of children wouldn't have suffered as much as those children suffered. Had we done it with Shannon Kustachin, a lot of children in Thunder Bay Inquiry would not be missing. And uh, if we do it now, imagine the good world that we can do. So a lot of people say, oh, I don't have time for reconciliation. Uh, but you go and talk to kids, and they get the job done. I'm about to show you a music video. The song was written by kids, performed by kids, and put up on iTunes in four days. <laughs> and they have a message for you about reconciliation. So uh, you can download this and show, them, show this to kids in your own life. It's one of the most viewed videos on iTunes. Do you want to see it?
try, try. I'm never gonna say goodbye. Let's dead each other up. Every day we fly. And bring each other down. So stressful. From the edit to the rhyme. And be successful. Always remember to share when and cool. Keep it up, trying to what we're daring to do. My friends, I like to support. I know that life is too short. I wanna reach out and change the world around me today. I wanna see progress. Cause all I'm seeing is the nonsense. This is the process. So I'm running with my people when we got this. I love the food for the thoughtless. They're wondering if adults can change it too. And I think that each and every one of you can change the world. You're going to have to do something. You're going to have to support the end of this inequality. And if you do, and if you teach the generation of children that you love and care about, that the world can be different if they just make it different, I think there's a little girl somewhere up there who loves blue flowers that will be shining a light on all of us. Thank you very much.